when you can read and interpret one correctly, a wiring diagram helps you to understand several aspects of that piece of equipment. How the unit operates, what the unit does during each mode of operation, how to make installation connections, and how to troubleshoot and repair refrigeration, heating, and air conditioning systems. In this segment, we'll examine different types of wiring diagrams and explain how to read basic schematics. Of all the electric diagram types, the schematic diagram is the most useful and easiest to follow. It tells you how, when, and why a system works. The schematic diagram includes the symbols and line representations so that the user can easily identify loads and switches in any given circuit. In this diagram, we can see that the power source for this circuit is supplied to terminals L1 and L2, and the device being controlled is a compressor. The compressor is controlled by a thermostat that closes on a rise in temperature. This diagram also shows the conductors that connect the power supply to the other circuit components, such as the run capacitor. When there is power connected to L1 and L2, the compressor will operate as long as the thermostat is in a closed position and all the conductors are in good shape. The portion of the wiring diagram called the legend provides explanations for the abbreviations used in the wiring diagram. This diagram also clarifies the symbols used and the types of wiring that are found in the diagram. Schematic diagrams also indicate terminal numbers as they appear in the system components to help you when you're troubleshooting. The pictorial diagram is intended to show the actual internal wiring of the unit as well as the location of the components in the control panel. Each and every wire is shown in this diagram along with the color of each. This makes it easier to identify circuits. Components that are not located within the control panel are drawn outside the panel and labeled. Pictorial diagrams are especially useful when you need to locate a specific component and not necessarily troubleshoot the system. Wiring diagrams can usually be found attached to one of the service panels and can be schematic, pictorial, or combination of both. Symbols used in wiring diagrams vary somewhat from system to system and a technician should be aware of these differences. First, we'll look at the power supply in a schematic diagram, which is often represented by two vertical lines labeled L1 and L2. Anything connecting these two vertical lines represents a circuit within the system that is being supplied by 230 volts. For example, adding a fan motor and a thermostat creates a circuit. Assuming the thermostat is in a closed position, the conductors are in good shape, the fan motor is operational and power is being supplied, the motor will operate. In a similar circuit, we can see that there are two loads instead of one. Here we can see the compressor and blower motor are in separate parallel circuits. Each load in a parallel circuit is controlled by a different set of switches. The compressor, for instance, is controlled by two normally open sets of contacts labeled C in the diagram. When these two sets of contacts close, current flows in the compressor circuit and the compressor operates. The blower motor in this circuit is also controlled by a set of normally open contacts labeled BR in the diagram. The two circles labeled C and BR represent the coils of a contactor and a relay, respectively, and are wired in parallel with each other. When this switch is in the open position, no current can flow through either of the coils. However, when the switch is in the closed position, current will flow through both coils, causing the contacts to close. 
The circuit by circuit arrangement of the schematic diagram is very helpful. Because of the complexity of many control panels, isolating one circuit at a time is a big plus to the troubleshooting technician. When faced with a slightly more complicated diagram, such as this one, the technician should evaluate each circuit separately in order to locate the cause for system malfunction. Next, we'll examine some simple, real-life schematics. By examining them closely, we can determine how the specific piece of equipment is intended to operate. A dehumidifier is a piece of equipment that is designed to remove humidity from an area. A dehumidifier is made up of three components, the compressor, the fan motor, and the humidistat. From the schematic diagram of the dehumidifier, we can see that the compressor and the fan motor are wired in parallel with each other, and both are in series with the humidistat. The humidistat will close its contacts on a rise in humidity. When the humidity level drops below the set point, the contacts on the humidistat will open, de-energizing the compressor and the fan motor. Window air conditioners are commonly used to cool small areas and are among the most popular type of air conditioning systems. Although the complexity of this type of system varies greatly, the circuits are designed to operate in a similar manner. The unit is equipped with a compressor, a fan motor, a control switch, and a thermostat. The control switch is labeled CS and has four terminals, numbered one through four. The fan motor, compressor, and thermostat are labeled FM, C, and T, respectively. One of the power lines is connected directly to the control switch at terminal four. When switched to the fan only position, there's an internal switch connection between terminals four and two, completing the circuit through the fan motor. When switched to the cooled position, internal connections between terminals four and three are also made. When in this position, the fan motor will energize and the compressor will cycle on and off depending on the position of the thermostat. Even when the compressor cycles off, the fan motor will continue to operate because the fan motor circuit is still energized. When the unit is turned off by the occupant of the space, all components will cycle off. Walk-in coolers are basically big refrigeration units used for large-scale storage. Even though the size of these boxes varies greatly, the basic operation of the unit is essentially the same. Electrically speaking, the walk-in box consists of a compressor, a condenser fan motor, a defrost timer, and a fan motor inside the box itself. The schematic diagram for this type of system shown here. While operating, the evaporator fan motor and the defrost timer motor are energized all the time. Notice that there are no switches in series with these two system components. The compressor and condenser fan motor are wired in parallel with each other and are intended to cycle on and off together. In this system, there are three switches that are wired in series with both the compressor and the condenser fan motor and all three must be in a closed position for system operation. The high pressure switch, labeled HPS, is designed to open its contacts if the pressure in the system reaches an unsafe level. The low pressure switch, labeled LPS, is designed to open its contacts if the pressure in the system drops below a predetermined set point. The low pressure switch can be used to either protect the system in the event it loses its refrigerant charge or to maintain the cooler at the desired temperature. The defrost contacts, labeled DT, are controlled by the mechanical timer that's energized all the time. At predetermined time intervals, the contacts will open and cycle the compressor off, 
to allow any ice that formed on the coil to melt. It's important to remember that even when the compressor cycles off, the evaporator fan motor and timer motor will remain energized because they're in separate parallel circuits. The main difference between the walk-in cooler and the walk-in freezer is the temperature that's maintained inside the box. Freezer boxes maintain temperatures lower than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The main difference between a walk-in cooler and a walk-in freezer is the addition of a defrost heater, which removes any ice buildup on the evaporator coil at predetermined time intervals. In this schematic for a simple walk-in freezer, we can see that the defrost timer motor is energized all the time. The compressor, condenser fan motor, and the evaporator fan motor are all wired together and cycle on and off at the same time. The thermostat must be in the closed position in order for the compressor to operate. In addition, the defrost contacts 4 and 1 must be in the closed position as well. After a predetermined period of time, the defrost timer contacts will switch position, making contact between terminals 4 and 2. This will de-energize the compressor and both of the fan motors. At the same time, it will energize the defrost heater circuit. The system is now in defrost, and any ice that is formed on the evaporator coil is melting. Once the defrost cycle is over, the contacts on the defrost control will switch back, putting the system back into the cooling mode. The simplest type of gas furnace has a standing pilot. In essence, the operation of this type of furnace is controlled by a thermostat and a thermocouple. This furnace often operates with a low voltage control circuit and uses a transformer to provide this control voltage. The two main components in the furnace are the fan motor and the gas valve. In this schematic diagram of the furnace, you can see that there are two different voltages in this circuit. The 24 volts are generated by the transformer, which is connected to the 120 volt power supply. Notice that there are three thermostats in this unit. The first thermostat is the heating thermostat, labeled HT. This thermostat is located within the occupied space and closes its contacts when the space temperature falls below a predetermined set point. This thermostat is wired in series with the gas valve. The other thermostat in series with the gas valve is the limit switch, labeled LS, which is a safety device and will only open its contacts if the temperature in the furnace reaches an unsafe level. If both the heating thermostat and the limit switches are in the closed position, the gas valve will open. The opening of the gas valve will cause gas to flow through the gas rack, where it's ignited by the pilot light. As heat begins to build up in the furnace, the third thermostat, the fan switch, nears the point at which it will close. When the fan switch closes, the fan motor will cycle on, supplying the heated air to the occupied space. At the end of the heating cycle, the heating thermostat will open, de-energizing the gas valve, causing the flames on the gas rack to extinguish. As the heat dissipates from the system, the fan switch contacts will open, de-energizing the fan motor. Packaged air conditioning equipment is manufactured in one piece with all the components included, except for the thermostat. The thermostat is connected to the unit by means of a low voltage control circuit. The low voltage schematic diagram is shown here. The transformer feeds low voltage to the thermostat through terminal R. The G terminal on the thermostat feeds the indoor fan circuit and controls the IFR, or indoor fan motor, relay. The Y terminal feeds the compressor circuit and controls the coil on the compressor contactor. 
When the thermostat calls for a compressor operation, current flows through the contactor coil. When the thermostat calls for fan operation, the fan relay coil is energized. In the line voltage portion of the diagram, we have the line voltage being supplied to the circuit through L1 and L2. The compressor and condenser fan motor will be energized whenever contacts C1 and C2 are closed. The indoor fan motor will be energized whenever the IFR contacts are closed. The complete wiring diagram can be seen here. Being able to interpret these diagrams enables the technician to successfully troubleshoot and understand the system's sequence of operations. Common types of wiring diagrams are the schematic and pictorial. The schematic diagram is the most useful and easiest to follow of any electric diagram. The schematic tells the technician how and why the system operates as it does. The pictorial diagram is primarily used to locate components in a control panel. Technicians should be familiar with the symbols commonly found in wire and diagrams. Loads in parallel circuits operate independently of each other. The switches wired in series with the loads control the operation of the loads. Low voltage control circuits are often used to control the operation of the line voltage components. Transformers are used to supply the low voltage to the control circuit. This series continues in segment five on alternating